Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Walter Alexander, uh, I'm a resident solution architect with Snowflake. Uh, this is Scott Redding. I've been working with data for 30 years. I've performed pretty much just about any role from uh, operations to design. I've been a developer, DBA, architect, uh, but I always seem to fall back on performance optimization. I've uh, worked on products like Oracle, Teradata, Hadoop, and Aster. Yeah, I'm Scott Redding. Yeah, so I've, I've been at Snowflake for three years, resident solutions architect. Uh, we both work in professional services. We support our Snowflake customers uh, either through a resident solutions architect or through packages as a professional services team to help consult and uh, make you enable you guys to run your Snowflake uh, instances efficiently and effectively using best practices. So skip the agenda. Yeah. Just get right into it. Yeah, let's get into it. All right, so Double Black Diamonds. Um, I joined the company a little over two years ago, and I was put on a large account, and the directive was performance optimization. So being a new resource, it, it was rather challenging. Okay, what I ended up doing was developing SQL to do analysis to identify issues. And I noticed that the customer, my customer, as well as here talking to other FCs and SAs, that other customers wanted equivalent SQL. So uh, I started developing it for account usage as well, and then ultimately developed it for information schema. And then as we used that code, uh, we found that, you know, we provided the base SQL, so it was very, very flexible. You could do whatever you wanted with it. We started giving it to customers. They started building dashboards. They put it in Tableau, Streamlit. We even created some dashboards in Streamlit. Uh, just recently, that code has been taken incorporated with uh, alerts and notifications, which are in public preview for a couple of customers. So we're trying that out as well. But the further we went, the bigger it got. We've got over 300 scripts now. There's three repositories. We cover cost, implementation, and performance. And then in addition to that, we created a lot of documentation so that we could do work sessions with the customer. So we can do enablement for uh, SQL best practices, selecting physical features, as well as doing performance optimization. In using it, most performance packages just identify the request, you know, and in the case of Snowflake, it might be something like remote spilling. And, you know, what's the solution? A lot of people think just increase the size of the warehouse. But in using the scripts and understanding Snowflake better, we found that, you know, you should go through and look at your SQL, make sure you're following best practices. We, we have made changes uh, in SQL for customers and gotten dramatic improvements. Uh, and in addition to that, selecting your physical features. Snowflake is great because it has very few features. It's not like other products that have tons of different types of indexes or anything. We basically have cluster key, materialized view, search optimization, uh, query acceleration. Uh, but the question is, how do you pick a cluster key? or how do you decide when to use some materialized view research optimization? So in addition to identifying issues uh, that you're having, uh, we also are building capabilities that help you make those informed decisions to pick your cluster keys or when to use a materialized view. Uh, and then lastly is workload management. A lot of people will just you know jump the gun and increase the t-shirt size, but that's kind of a double-edged sword because now you're paying more. We're gonna show you why further on in the, in the presentation. Uh, but we have analysis scripts for workload management as well to help you understand what size virtual warehouse you should have, how many clusters you should have, that type of things. We also look at you know how to split workload and combine workload to get more out of your investment. Cool. So what is workload management? I guess that's the key. That's how we define it. Workload management, the process of identifying workload profiles, distributing that work to virtual warehouses that execute within your cost and performance expectations. That's the key, right? Like. If you have SLAs on certain jobs, maybe you're willing to pay more for that query to run faster to meet an SLA. Sometimes if there's no SLA, you can let that query run forever. So there's always a balance in workload management, workload optimization, and, and Snowflake, you have flexibility to like turn the dial up or turn it back down depending on your needs. So what do we consider workload? So when you're looking at workload management, you want to break your workloads up into different sections like inserts and ETL pipelines and regular select, you have BI workloads, you have ML workloads, you have all sorts of different workloads that you want to kind of identify and kind of group together as as a certain workload type. Um, that's the key to trying to figure out 
your optimal warehouse size per workload versus just having a bunch of warehouses underutilized all the time. Um, so we're going to go through some things that hopefully everybody knows this. It's out on Snowflake Docs, but uh, this is just a reminder of virtual warehouse credits that the number of servers in a cluster on that t-shirt size is the number of credits per hour. Um, so when we talk about um, servers or nodes inside of a cluster, the number of credits per hour shows you that, right? So all, all, we, all the way up to a 6x large, which is 512 uh, servers in a cluster when you run that SQL query. Um, and then Snowpark optimized servers on the bottom. That's our newer Snowpark memory optimized servers um, that you can use as well. And you see those credits, same thing. Use those. It's use these credits per hour to do some analysis on your, your cost and stuff like that. We'll show you here in a second. So elapsed time for a credit. So based on this concept of workload optimization and credits per hour, uh, you want to find a workload. What we say is basically every query probably has an optimal size workload to run on. And every query would have kind of this curve or somewhere of this curve. So from your left to right, you have extra small all the way down to all the way to 4XL. This is an example of running a CTAS with 1.3 terabytes of data. Um, as you can see, this line, if I have a winner, yeah. Oh, you can't see really. So this line going up is credits. This line is time spent. So as you go up from extra small to small, the runtime decreases by half, but your cost increases by double. So whenever you move up warehouse size, you double your cost. So when you double your cost, you want to, it should drop your runtime by half. Otherwise, you're just spending more for nothing. That's where you get into the idea of, is there an SLA I want to meet? Am I willing to pay more per credit for to get this the query to run faster? But then there's, when you drop here by half, you pay less. So you can always, there's send, it's times when you can move up a warehouse size and pay less than you would if you ran it on a smaller warehouse. There's always this cross intersection of the optimal size to run. And that's what you kind of want to get to. So how do you get there? This is warehouse sizing. Um, this is my idea of how you should size a warehouse um, out of the gate. It's a general recommendation up front to understand which warehouse size to pick. There is notes at the bottom. Do note that micro partition scanned is a, a major thing that causes you to understand what size warehouse, but there are other things like um, how complex the query is. If you're doing joint explosions, um, if you have massive sorts in your query, then it could be better to use a bigger warehouse. Um, so this is directional um, recommendation up front, but it gives you an easy way to do it. So what is this giant slide deck here? Um, over here is your micro partition scan. So when you look in query profile of a query, right, it shows overall in the query how many micro partitions were scanned. So that's what you want to look at here when you're looking at a query to figure out which warehouse size is probably the best or where, where you want to sit in the warehouse sizes. So for example, 2000 micro partitions scanned in a query, you probably want to go to an extra small, small. Once you get to a medium, a medium and above, you're probably going to just waste a ton of credits and actually you'll probably run worse because you'll get compute skew on this side. So what it is, so extra small, you're like, why is this an eight? Extra small is one server, right? So each node has about eight processing threads. That's pretty well known. So you multiply number of nodes times eight. So you know exactly how many processing threads a node on a warehouse cluster has. And then just divide this micro partitions number by number of threads. So what that tells you is that every CPU on that box is going to run, is going to take up 250 of those micro partitions and process them. We do spread out. Every query is spread out completely against an entire cluster against every processing thread. So if you get to over on this side, if you to have too big of a warehouse with not enough data, then you have a bunch of CPUs and threads doing absolutely nothing, just sitting waiting for the other guy. Some get micro partitions, some don't. You get a ton of compute skew over here. So you don't want to be in the red here. In the red bottom side here, you have too many micro partitions. So you could get a ton of spilling, right? And you don't want spilling to remote disk. You could also get out of memory errors over here as well. So you want to stay somewhere in the middle of the green to yellow area. I, I've found the best is anywhere between 100 micro partitions to probably 500. If you have really big data, 
like I support Instacart who has tons and tons of data, 20 petabytes of data. If you have really big data, you can hit this 2000 mark and it's, it's still pretty optimal, but a lot of people don't have that many micro partitions being scanned. So we'll go on to the next. So now that you guys understand like how to look at your warehouse, we'll go into some of our scripts that we've built and uh, warehouse. So where do you start with this? So warehouse cost is the first, what you want to do up front is identify like where to start. Like, where do I start optimizing stuff? Like I have a hundred thousand queries running this script right here. Um, cost AU 02. Well, at the end, there's a, there's a link to this. So these are published on GitHub, by the way, if everybody's like, where are these scripts going to be? Um, <laughs> we have it out on GitHub and Snowflake Labs GitHub. And I'll, we'll show you the link later. But so there's a script that basically does analysis over time. Where do you start finding your most expensive warehouses first? So this is the idea, find top consuming warehouses and then just start going through there. So what would a script, one of the scripts and visualize it like this, obviously sample data, these analytics warehouses, but it would be something like this. So where would you focus? You would try to start focusing on this guy is obviously app warehouse one is one of your most expensive warehouses. He has huge spikes here. Um, start focusing on what's going on here and overall in this warehouse. So this is just like a, how the process you should follow to optimize your Snowflake workloads. So this is just some insights. Like I said, App Warehouse One, things you look at, just look for spikes, look for higher, highest cost warehouses, and then start drilling down from there. So where do we go um, from there? Drill down to high level profiling a warehouse. You'd basically find your most expensive warehouse and start profiling the data on that warehouse. Uh, so this is where you want to understand how warehouses are performing at a day level. So you usually run this script against a single warehouse. The script will run and basically request, it'll count distinct number of queries by time buckets, which is super helpful. Actually, it's strangely helpful and it'll count spilling partition elimination, pretty much the, the key metrics you want to look at when you're performance optimizing these metrics, these warehouse workloads. So this is what it looks like in a spreadsheet. If you pull the data out, when you run the scripts, warehouse name, warehouse size. The cool thing is that I was talking about short requests, medium requests, long requests. This is kind of where you want to focus your attention on where you're seeing different types of workloads on the same warehouse. This is where workload management gets into Pele. For example, this app warehouse two has 56,000 queries running that are short requests, but it has, you know, a few medium requests. Like this guy has some, a lot of short requests a long request. You want to, you want to focus on these long requests over here and figure out, you want to follow the pattern we showed earlier, where you want to figure out, can I optimize the SQL? If I can't optimize the SQL, can I optimize the objects via clustering and all of those techniques? Can I turn QAS on and get better optimization and kill these long running requests? And then as last resort, if it is truly a query that is just more complex or too big, then you want to start moving these long requests ones off to a bigger warehouse, if you will, if you can't optimize them, but always optimize first, never just turn a warehouse up a size. All right. So what do you look for? <clears throat> Spilling and queuing is occurring. Queuing is a double-edged sword as well. Uh, we always say, you know, queuing is bad, but really from your SLA perspectives, queuing is good, right? It, you want to pack a warehouse. If you don't have a lot of queuing, then you're underutilizing your warehouse mostly, right? If you're sending a bunch of queries in and nothing is queuing, then you're probably underutilized your warehouse. It's an indicator. Like if you see a, a SQL query cart start queue up, you know, we Snowflake has used all the resources on that warehouse and we were holding a query back. So it's actually a good thing to understand like where that level of queuing starts occurring and then decide if you want to scale out to multi-cluster warehouses and stuff. So. Queuing is good unless it's breaking your SLAs, right? Um, back to the whole turn it up, turn it down concept. Start scaling out, scale up. Just make sure you're within your budget and your constraints and you're optimizing before you just start spending a bunch of money for no reason. Partition elimination is a big one as well. So look for that. That's where the clustering is key for partition elimination. Then we'll go into workload detail profiling. So once you identify your warehouse and you see the overall high level workloads, lots of short requests, some long requests, start focusing on those long requests and you'll start drilling into the work types and the work profile, the query type buckets. So then you'll even go lower to see, okay, of those queries, what 
types of queries there are. So this would show you like create table as is. These are probably big transformation type queries. You have some straight inserts. You have a lot of selects, right? And this is where you start seeing, hey, this app warehouse two has 184,000 selects running less than a second, which is great. Even maybe some of these could move down a warehouse side, but all these guys out here are greater than 90 seconds. You need to look at and determine if they should be running on this app warehouse two, or maybe you should have an app warehouse two large instead to move it to. So this is a good indicator of how you can analyze your workloads uh, in detail. Uh, kind of went over this already. So yeah, things to look out for OLAP and OLTP type requests. That's kind of the making sure mixed workloads aren't occurring on your warehouse. That's kind of the theme here. A little over a year ago, uh, we started looking into trying to understand how efficiently our customers are using their virtual warehouses. And uh, it took us about three months to figure out. We're, we're going to show you some uh, a, a report uh, that we developed. Uh, it's not available on account usage yet, but we're, we're driving towards that. We're developing it right now. Uh, but basically what it does is it helps us understand, you know, how much uptime you have, how many resources you're, you're actually paying for versus using. And once we have that information, that gives us uh, great insights into what needs to be done. Typically, the next step is looking at, at concurrency uh, on those virtual warehouses, but it leads us to things, talk to the customer about things like, you know, is 10% of your workload on a 2XL while 90% should be on an extra small? Uh, are there other workloads that are similar that run at the same time or different times where we can combine that workload into the same virtual warehouse? and and eliminate a warehouse uh things like that so you know in the old days my wow, god that sounds funny on-prem you know those systems were kept busy pretty much 100 percent all the time and workload management was necessary in order to make everything you know work on that box that's running 100 percent uh what we're seeing on snowflake with our customers is they you know some customers they'll they'll create over 100 virtual warehouses and they'll dedicate those workloads to individual warehouses, but then they do something like they only have two concurrent queries that run all day long, okay? If you can run eight concurrently on a cluster, well, then you're only using 25% of the system, which means 75% of what you're paying for, you're not using. So we want to identify that uh, and help you guys save that money. In addition to that, there are other things like combining workloads, splitting workload you know, changing warehouse size that we can glean from that. So this chart represents a visual of, you know, hey, we've got an extra small, it's up for a certain time during the day, then it, it gets suspended, and then it starts up again, and then, you know, it does more work. It could have, you know, scaled up to, you know, extra, extra small, say to a medium, then back down to an extra small. We want to look at stuff like that and understand how the customer's using that warehouse. Okay, so this is that example I was telling you about. So on the left, uh, you see the warehouse name and then you see uptime. It's not used CPU and idle CPU. We meant to put uh, time there. We didn't have a time to change it. But the point is you start your warehouse and you start using that warehouse. Then you stop using the warehouse and it sits idle. Maybe you got it set for 10 minutes. You're paying for that 10 minutes. It auto suspends. Then a while later, you start the thing back up and maybe you're running something heavy and you alter the warehouse from one size to another, then back down. We track all of those events and we take that wall clock time and we convert it so that we can understand the credits that are being used. So uh, there's 86,400 seconds in a day, 3,600 seconds in an hour. We look at the t-shirt size, uh, the number of clusters, the number of threads to figure this information out. And ultimately what we do is we determine the uptime in thread, uh, thread second. Then what we do is we grab what you actually used and compare those numbers. And from that, we can figure out how much of your system is idle. So you're, you're paying for that idle time, but you're not using it. And then as a result of that, we figure out what the warehouse efficiency is. Once we have these numbers, that really tells us a lot of insights about what you're doing and what we need to help you understand how to get 
you know, more out of your investment. So if you have a really high uptime and a low efficiency, then you're, you're wasting a lot and a lot of credits. If you've got a, a, a low uptime and still a low efficiency, you're not really wasting as much credits because the warehouse is so small, it can run for a long time and you not burn a lot of credits. You get into something like 2XL, 4XL, man, you're burning credits, okay? it's It can be very, very expensive. Uh, I'd like to tell you some of the numbers that Scott and I have saved customers that we're not allowed to, but this really tells us a lot of great information. Typically what we do is once we have that and understand the efficiencies and the idle times, typically what we'll do is we'll start looking at the concurrency on those virtual warehouses. Uh, I was actually in a meeting with the customer and I showed them the warehouse efficiency and someone said, well, I, I just don't believe that. Okay, let me show you the concurrency chart. And then once they understood the concurrency chart and then looked back at the efficiency, they went, now that makes sense. What do we got to do to fix it? So let's go ahead and move on up to concurrency. So what we're trying to do there is understand the workload concurrency. What's, what's actually running concurrently and we also look at what's queued concurrently. And if we pair that up with the warehouse efficiency, that tells a great story about how you're using those warehouses. So let's go ahead and, yeah, okay. So the red lines represent uh, the hypothetical OLAP, you know, eight requests uh, per cluster. So if you go beyond the first line, you're probably gonna scale out. Go beyond the second line, you're gonna scale out again uh, on, on out to whatever your max is set to. Uh, what you have to realize is, the, you know, with the green line being requests, anything below the red line, that's your idle time. You're spending money on that time, but you're not using those resources. Okay, this is a pretty healthy chart. There's also queuing in there, and there's various types of queuing. We'll get to that as well. Let's go ahead and move to the next one. So utilization from just purely requests that are running concurrently, that first line uh represents your first cluster and you've got like averaging first half of the day one or two concurrent requests okay so you're using 12 and a half to 25 percent of the box sometimes 50 percent of the box uh, but what happens in the first half of the day is you're constantly running requests but you're not fully utilizing the system so you have all that idle time you're you're paying for it okay on-prem, we always kept it 100% busy, but what we're finding is some customers are not keeping it busy with their virtual warehouses because they're dedicating a workload to just one warehouse or just dedicating one workload to a warehouse, All right, Halfway through the day, they start doing more work and then they have to scale out to facilitate that work. But when they scale out again, the second cluster has idle time. But in that case, you spin it up you get the work done, you spin it down so it's not as costly. Then going through the second half of the day, again, you have a lot of idle time where you're spending credits, but in this case, you're, you know, you're closer to you know averaging about 50% utilization. All right, next one is queuing. So this is an example of utilization with queuing. Basically what's happening here is the customer has, or in our sample data, the max is set to two. So starting out the day, they're keeping it pretty busy. Uh, they're getting a little better throughput than, uh, than, uh, than on that first cluster. So it's going a little bit higher than eight. But then all of a sudden, more requests come into the system and they scale out. Now, there's like four types of queuing that can occur. We're going to cover that in the queuing section. But what happens here is when you scale out, you're automatically going to have a queue for like one to three seconds. So then the cluster starts up and that work comes out of the queue and it starts being facilitated. But then in this case, it hits two, max is two, more requests come in, it just can't facilitate it. So queue, work gets queued for longer. In each case, every time you scale out, you still have idle time that you're paying for. All right, go ahead. All right, so uh, insights gained. We're going to cover more about queuing in the next section, but basically, you know, you suspend, you resume, you can have a queue when you scale out or resume. Low concurrency means that the cluster is not fully utilized and higher concurrency with queuing could be for max clusters not being large enough uh, or there's a throughput issue with your requests. Like said, Scott said earlier, queuing can be a good thing because it's an indicator that you're, you're utilizing uh, your servers. All right, from there, what we do is the higher concurrency with long queues, we want to analyze that. 
for the lower uh, concurrency with warehouses are not fully utilized, we're going to look for opportunities to combine the workload. Now, like I said, we're going to discuss queuing a little bit later. All right, go ahead and... Okay, you got this one. All right. Okay. I'm going to jump to spilling real fast. Uh, another key metric on warehouse optimization and workload optimization is, is making sure you're not spilling. There's a couple of scripts here. Uh, basically, we're trying to identify uh, queries that aren't fitting into the warehouse size they're in. Well, basically, spilling, right? You have two types of spilling. Spilling to uh, local spilling and remote spilling. So the local spilling is is not as bad if you see that in query profile. Uh, local spilling is basically we can't fit everything into memory, so we spilled our SSD drive disks that are attached to the nodes in the warehouse. So those SSDs are really fast, so local spilling, not that bad. Um, what happens, though, if you have a bunch of concurrent queries running on the same warehouse, they are competing for resources. So um, if if one query is starting to take up a lot of memory and another query comes in and it can't fit into memory, then it spills to local. And then if they start competing, then we'll try to spill to remote. And spilling to remote disk is actually spilling all the way back to blob storage, so S3. Um, those writes and reads from remote storage are, are pretty slow, so that's when you'll get significant slowness in your queries when you see remote um, so you want to minimize that as much as possible. Okay, and we're missing the slide, but okay. <laughs> where happened? I'm not sure where it went. But uh, here, we'll just say what we saw. So um, what you can see from the spilling is uh, queries running on a small warehouse. If they're spilling a lot of data, local or remote disk. Um, it's basically showing what you want to see from there. Um, one thing, so why spilling is a, could be a problem. Um, join explosions. So everybody knows a Cartesian and a partial Cartesian join could be an issue. If you have small amounts of micropartitions being scanned, uh, say you have a thousand rows coming in on one side and the other, but you do a Cartesian, suddenly you expanded that data out um, from where it was. So that's one thing to look out for is a, a Cartesians. And then the biggest issue is if you see a query that's maybe it runs at 2 p.m. in the day and it runs for like five minutes, but for some reason at 5 p.m. that same query runs and it runs for like an hour, well, most of the time, that's probably going to be a concurrency issue where there's another big job running at that same time. So I think in the world of cloud and the world of Snowflake, where you have infinite compute, I think people have, I guess, put it aside that you, you can still have contention, right? So you do need to like not make some bigger jobs running at the same time. You don't want a ton of big jobs running at the same time on the same warehouse. Snowflake controls that a little bit, but it's not perfect and you can get severe contention and see like significant changes and fluctuations in your queries and the query runtimes based on what jobs are running concurrently with those other queries. All right, I mentioned earlier, there's four types of queuing that can affect occur. Um, some queuing is just fine. You won't even notice it. Uh, I call that good queuing. There is bad queuing where it does has, have an impact and you do notice it, but then I also find there's bad queuing that is actually good queuing. It all boils down to you talking to the customer about what their preferences are for their throughput and, and what they're trying to run. The DOP effect basically is you're exhausting the degree of parallelism. So on a single cluster, theoretically, you can run like eight, eight queries. There are other types of queries that run that are sub-second, could be considered OLTP or tactical, whatever term you use, and you can get higher throughput on that. But typically it's it's eight, and when you hit eight concurrent and you start queuing, then you want to scale out. If you can't scale out, well, then it goes into the queue. The swim lane effect, that's always an interesting one. That's when you have a query that's running on your system or maybe two or three queries running on your system. Basically, they run for a really long time, and they block resources for other requests. So if you've got a request that's running for an hour, now your throughput falls or your concurrency falls to seven requests versus eight requests. So you're trying to get work through on, on eight threads. So you got to be careful with what you're running on the system because you can start work, you can start causing work to get backed up. Of course, uh, you know, if you scale out, then you can remediate that. Uh, there's a lot of other things you can do to remediate it as well, but it's just good to know. The next one is the resource effect. It's similar to swim lane and it's similar to having the, the box fully utilized, but we've seen special cases where customers will 
They'll do something like they'll create an API that generates the SQL. It's not ANSI standard SQL. The SQL's 10,000 lines long. The optimizer, you know, starts over allocating memory. You see this and there's remote spilling occurring. So they increase the warehouse size to get it to a point where the spilling's not occurring. They, you know, they try to fix the SQL to make it run better. But the bottom line is that it, they didn't want to change the API. And they went all the way to uh, a 2XL. But they could only run two queries concurrently because they use so much memory. There was no memory left for other queries to run. So uh, that can have uh, an effect. And then the scaling effect, that's, uh, you know, when you suspend your cluster and a query is submitted, it'll make the cluster resume. You'll go into the queue for one to three seconds. If you reach that limit and you got to scale out again, you'll be thrown in the queue but for a very short period of time. So like I said, there's good queuing, there's bad queuing, and then there's uh, bad queuing that's good queuing because <laughs> that indicates that in some cases uh, that you're fully utilized. You expect it fully utilized. I was talking to a customer and they had a, like a batch report and they would submit like 200 reports all at the same time. They expected to queue up. They wanted to fully utilize their, their cluster. So to them, that was good. You know, one thing to note on scaling effect that, that he mentioned it's in the documentation, but people don't really read it, that when you scale out, if you have a multi-cluster warehouse that's set, let's say, max of three clusters, that first scale out from one cluster to two clusters happens relatively instantaneously, depending on if you have standard economy scaling on. That third scale out will sit for 20 seconds. Like it has to, Snowflake has to detect that things are queuing up enough to last another 20 seconds before it decides to scale out a third. It's trying to do that to save you money, but just make sure you know, like when you see, it's something I see customers all the time, like, hey, I have 20 cluster scale out, but I see queuing and this this incremental queuing, it's a scaling effect queuing occurring where when scaling to node three and or cluster three, cluster four, cluster five, you get these 20 second batches of queuing before we decide to scale to help you save money, but just to make sure we scale out when we need to. So we've got some examples of queuing. So you see, uh, the request concurrency. In this case, you see that the volume of concurrency increases. Work goes into the queue. And in this case, uh, the max is set to two. So yeah, you're getting concurrency. You're facilitating it with the first scale out, but then you go to scale out again and you hit the max. So that everything goes into the queue and it, and it gets delayed until work can get through. Uh, okay, I'll tell you what that is. So there's 84,600 or 86,400 seconds in a day. Okay. We take every query that's run on that warehouse and we map it out by the second to get the overlap. That way we can chart it out. Go off topic a little bit from just queuing. Uh, what we do is, if you think about it, when you have queuing occurring, it's not actually the queuing period that's the issue. It's everything that leads up to the queuing that's the issue. So if it's a long running query causing like a swim lane effect or you're just throwing too much at the box, that type thing. What we do is we take that number. We'll, you know, we'll put the mouse over the chart. We'll find the number. We have a script where you plug in that number and it'll show you everything that was running at that second. That first queuing event, I'd go right to the beginning of it and I'll plug in the number for that. Uh, maybe I'll go a minute before that, plug that number in and see what's going on. And that'll show me what happened leading up to the queuing event. So that's why we put those numbers at the bottom. Because that's what we call point in time. It's that second of the day where uh, where work is working or occurring. We had another slide. I don't know why it's not showing up on the screen, but basically, so we just showed you one where uh, you had the scaling effect. We had another one that was not so bad uh, queuing, basically auto resume and scale out. It shows the amount of time that requests are in the queue when an auto resume versus or uh, auto scale or scale out occurs so uh you can see that it's very short periods let's go ahead and move on there we go duration so back to throughput duration all this like Wall was saying um all this queuing and stuff occurs sometimes because of long running requests so it's something to look at is, is your duration of queries running on those warehouses so this is some scripts to analyze that um, and figure out where your long running queries are in this warehouse and figure that out. And this one's blank too. 
Uh, so what you saw on the previous slide was uh, somewhere the, to show basically the same bucketing concept, right? Bucket your queries on a warehouse by runtime to figure out where your long running queries are. Um, analyze those long running queries again, never just throw it up to a bigger warehouse. Always do SQL optimization if you can, figure out where your issues are, if it's in the table scan, look at clustering, et cetera, everything we've talked about already before. In conclusion, so key takeaways here, again, as our presentation showed, make sure and optimize your Snowflake investment through workload optimization. Something is that it's a continuous process. Snowflake, you know, you say there's no real need for a DBA because um, we handle all the basically infrastructure, but there is a reason to have somebody watching this stuff and having somebody responsible for making sure things are running efficiently and effectively. Because as developers build stuff, they just start putting things on random warehouses. You start getting underutilization. Um, your Snowflake bill starts going up and then people think Snowflake's expensive, but it's really not. Um, it's just a misuse of Snowflake's infinite amount of compute and infinite amount of scalability. So make sure you're optimizing continuously. Um, again, our SQL scripts are in fact on the Snowflake Labs Git repo under Snowflake Labs, there's a, a section called SF samples. In that SF samples, there's a bunch of samples, but ours is sh says workload optimization queries. And then under that, um, there's account usage queries and information schema queries. So you'll be able to get that. And uh, if, if you need help, reach out to Snowflake Professional Services so we can help you with your workload optimization. Thanks, everybody.